Hi, welcome to Health Chat. I'm Dr. Alonzia Nguyen, and today we're going to talk about being healthy and safe while you travel. <clears throat> now, most people, when they think about travel, they, and they think about medical related to travel, they think about vaccines. We're not going to talk about vaccines today. We're going to talk about the things that you don't think about. We're going to talk about safety. We're going to talk about sexually transmitted infections, air transportation issues, environmental risks, heat, cold, altitude, and then travelers with special medical or health needs. So the first thing we're going to talk about is safety. Now, a lot of times when you are going to an underdeveloped part of the world, just by being a tourist and just by being an American, you are automatically considered wealthy. Even if you don't consider yourself wealthy by the standards of the local population, you are. So that automatically makes you a target for theft, robbery, in some parts of the world, kidnapping. So you want to always be cognizant of that fact. And you always want to not be um, flashy or conspicuous. So you always want to dress inconspicuously. You don't want to wear the big expensive watches or the big expensive jewelry. You want to leave all that stuff at home because depending on the hotel you're staying in, even leaving it in a hotel room, it may not be safe. So it's always best to just leave it at home. And if you must wear jewelry, um, just have it be very simple and not be flashy or um, eye-catching. You also want to avoid traveling at night, especially in an area that you are unfamiliar with. And if you do have to travel at night, you want to travel in pairs or groups. Um, you, it's always a good idea to travel in pairs or groups even during the day because you don't want to make yourself um, a prime target for, um, for crime. And when you are out and about, if you're carrying a wallet, and this goes true for men or women, you want to carry that wallet in the front pocket. You don't want to carry it in your back pocket because that makes it easier for you to um, be pickpocketed. And if you're carrying a purse or any type of bag, you want to carry the strap across your shoulder, not on one shoulder. Again, it makes it a lot harder for someone to grab your purse and run. And then because you always want to be aware and you always want to be aware of your surroundings, you don't want to be standing in the middle of a marketplace or on a street corner with a map or um, talking, just not being aware of your surroundings. And meanwhile, someone picks your pocket, grabs your purse, grabs your bag. You always want to be aware of your surroundings because you want to um, make it less likely that you're going to be a target for someone who's looking to rob someone. And if you're any type of in a vehicle, you want to wear a safety belt. Now, granted, in some parts of the world, and depending on the type of transportation, there may not be a safety belt, there, if, especially if you're on public transportation like a bus or something like that, there may not be safety belts. But if there are safety belts, definitely you want to wear them because just like in more industrialized countries, Motor vehicle accidents are a prime source of injury, death. So anything you can do to mitigate, mitigate that risk is um, wise, especially if you're going to be in an area where the roads are heavily populated or if they're very chaotic where there's pedestrians and bicycles and animals and buses and cars and everyone's kind of all um, going to the same spot, much more likely that there's going to be an accident. So if you do have a safety belt, you are going to decrease the risk that you'll get injured um, in, in that situation. Now, as far as sexually transmitted illnesses, now travel is often associated with casual sexual activity. Obviously not always, but a lot of people, when they're on vacation, um, they are a little freer with their sexual activity than they would be at home. So by some studies, between 5 and 50 percent of short-term travelers report sex with a new partner, and those um, sexual encounters are often unprotected by condoms. Um, another study showed that 30 percent, actually greater than 30 percent, of European expatriates who are living in sub-Saharan Africa engaged in sex with the indigenous population, with the local population, including commercial sex workers, prostitutes, and the, and the like. And one thing you want to think about is that the risk of sexually transmitted illnesses are going to be different in other countries than they are here. In fact, in some countries, the rate of HIV may be 50 to 500 times greater than in the United States or other Western European nations. So you always want to think about that kind of thing. So 
it's always best to avoid sexual contact with someone that you don't know, a new person, especially a commercial sex worker, because they are much more likely to be infected with HIV or some of the other um, sexually transmitted illnesses, so syphilis, chlamydia, things like that. But if you are going to engage in sexual contact, you definitely, definitely want to use a condom every single time. Now, when, when you're traveling, especially if you're traveling long distances, you can get what's called jet lag. You, you may have heard the term, but have not really understood what it is. Basically, what jet lag is, is the desynchronization of your biologic rhythms, which means your body says it's one time, but the clock where you are says it's something else. And the further you travel, the more likely you are to develop that. There have been some studies that say traveling east to west is worse, and some will say that traveling west to east is worse, but a lot of times it depends on the person. But in general, the greater the distance between your body clock and the clock of where you are, the more likely you are to develop it. So if you went from here to Texas, where the difference is only an hour, you're much less likely to have jet lag, whereas if you went to Europe, where the difference is six hours or seven hours, depending on the part of Europe you go to, you're much more likely to have a problem. And so there are all these studies and all these um, people, things that people have tried as far as how do you get over jet lag. And so some people say certain diet, some people say, you know, more protein, some people say lots of water or fluids. So there are all these theories, but nothing has been proven as far as diet. One thing that has been proven is light exposure during the daytime. So it's always best that when you are traveling to another part of the world where the time is different, that you want to acclimate to that time as soon as possible. So if you get off the plane and your body says it's 3 in the morning, but the local time says it's 9 a.m., you want to act like it's 9 a.m. So you want to go through your day and then go to bed at night at the same time that you normally would at home. That's the easiest way to get acclimated to the new time. Whereas if you stay on your body's clock, it's going to take you much longer to adapt to the local time. And obviously the longer you are in the new time, the more likely you are to adapt to that time. But like I said, light exposure during the daytime, that will help reset the body clock the fastest. Sometimes people will use sleeping pills, um, especially on long flights, to help them sleep so they are more awake when they get to their destination. Some people will use sleeping pills those first few nights in a um, location to help them sleep so that they can reset their body clock. Um, that, that's a personal choice. Some people do that, some people don't. Um, if you rely on the drugs, a lot of times that will make it harder to adapt naturally so that you wind up having to use those sleeping pills the whole time you're there. So that is one downside of using the sleeping pills if you, if you choose to use those. Melatonin is a natural um, chemical that your body produces. It, that's how your body regulates the sleep-wake cycle. So some people will take melatonin pills to increase their level of melatonin, which will increase their ability to function um, in the new time frame. So they have done studies that show that melatonin does work. The problem with doing that is that the melatonin that you can buy over the counter in your local drugstore is not regulated in, in the sense that one bottle of melatonin may not be equivalent to the next bottle of melatonin. So you're never really quite sure what you're getting. But it definitely helps a lot of people. It doesn't help everybody, but it definitely helps a lot of people. Um, and then another thing you want to think about as far as um, traveling on airplanes is, or blood clots, especially the longer flights you're on, the more you're at risk for blood clots. The, and it's primarily it's because you're not moving. When you're sitting in the airplane in a little small seat, your, your blood is not circulating, so it, you are much more prone to develop blood clots, especially if you are someone who has had a blood clot in the past, if you are on certain medicines that put you at risk for blood clots, if you are dehydrated, those are the kind of people that are at even higher risk for developing blood clots with travel. So the number one thing you want to do on an airplane to prevent or decrease your risk anyway of getting blood clots is to get up and move. So I'll, it's always a good idea to get up every hour 
and just walk around up, up and down the aisle. It doesn't have to be very long. So, you know, a few minutes, you get up, you walk a couple of laps up and down the aisle, then you come back and you sit down. And then the next hour, you do that again because that will get that blood flow going. But even if you can't get up, if you're in the window seat and you get tired of bothering your, your seat mates and they are giving you that evil eye for getting up every hour, just flex your feet back and forth because that will work those calf muscles, which will get that blood flow circulating as well and that will get that, decrease that risk for getting those blood clots. You want to stay well hydrated because, as I said, dehydration is a risk for developing those blood clots. So lots of water when you're on an airplane. You want to avoid alcohol when you're on the airplane because that can dehydrate you. And then some people will even buy the compression stockings, which are some of them you can buy over the counter without a doctor's prescription. Those are not as tight, but that can sometimes help. And then um, if you have had a history of blood clots in the past, definitely ask your doctor if they think that you should wear the compression stockings. And if so, they will probably want to give you a prescription for the stronger uh, compression stockings that you can wear for the flight, which again will, will push on those muscles, get that blood flow circulating, decrease the risk for developing those blood clots. People who are at really high risk, Sometimes doctors will put them on a blood thinner to use on the flight and on the flight back, but that's not generally for the general population. That's really for people who are at highest, highest risk for blood clots. Some people will always ask me, what about aspirin? Can I take aspirin? That's a blood thinner. Aspirin has never been proven to be effective to prevent blood clots from travel. If you want to take a, a, a aspirin, and your doctor said it's okay to take an aspirin, you can certainly do that. Just know that it may or may not be doing anything to help protect you against blood clots. Some of the other things you want to think about when you're traveling is the environment that you're going to be in while you're there. Now, obviously, you're going on this trip because you want to experience the environment that you're going to, whether it's sun, whether it's beach, whether it's you no know, altitude, um, whether it's in the water, if you're going scuba diving, something like that. But all of those put you at risk for different things, even though they're fun. So the first thing you want to think about is sun exposure. So a lot of times when you are going to a beach, or even if you're going on a ski trip or something where you feel like you're not going to be exposed to sun, you are, if you're going to be outside, you're going to be exposed to sun. So you want to use a good um, sunscreen, even if you're not someone who typically uses sunscreen or needs sunscreen, just because you're going to be outside more, you want to use a good sunscreen. You want at least an SPF 15. What SPF is, is a sun protection factor. And what that number means is how long you can be in the sun without getting burned compared to someone who is not using it. So an SPF 15 means you can be in the sun 15 times longer than someone who is unprotected without getting burned. It is not a linear number, however. So an SPF 30 does not give you twice as much protection as an SPF 15, and a 45 does not give you three times the protection as an SPF 15. It's more of a, what we call a J-shaped curve, which means it's kind of a, a slope. But you definitely the higher the number, the more protection, so the longer you can be out. But you still want to be sure that you reapply that because sometimes people will put the sunscreen on first thing in the morning and then they're in the pool, they're in, in the water, in the beach, they're sweating, and they never reapply it. You always want to reapply it minimum of every two hours or more frequently if you've been sweating or if you've been in the water because you want to maintain that protection because you don't want it to wash off because then it's not doing you any good. When you're up in the mountains and you're up at altitude, you also want to think about what we call altitude sickness, which is a potential hazard. The higher you go, the more likely you are to develop the, the symptoms, the, especially if you're someone who has had that illness before, because some people are more prone to it than others. The most common, side, the most common um, symptoms of altitude sickness are you get really fatigued, you can get a headache, you can get um, very confused, that, and some people can even go into a coma if it's a, a more severe case of it. Anytime you're at a really high altitude, the number one thing you want to do is you want to be allowing yourself time to acclimate to that altitude. So that first day or two you're at, it out, at a high altitude, you want to just take it easy. You don't want to go hiking and be 
active, active, active that first day, you really want to just relax and drink plenty of water, get plenty of sleep, and then after you've been there for a couple of days where you don't feel like you're getting really tired, then you can be more active. If, however, you do that and you do start feeling like you are getting short of breath or you're feeling really tired and rest is not doing it, the, the treatment for altitude sickness is descent in altitude. So if you are at 10,000 feet and you're feeling symptoms and you're feeling sick, then just descending even 1,000 to 2,000 feet. So if you're up in the mountains, you may want to go down to the base of the mountain and stay there for a few days until you start feeling better and then you can try going up in altitude again. If, you, if the symptoms come back when you go up again, then you need to go back down and just stay down and know that you cannot go up higher because you're too sensitive to that altitude. But just like with, um, just like with uh, the blood clots, the number one prevention is hydration. The, the more hydrated you are when you get to altitude, the better. So again, lots and lots of water. You want to avoid alcohol. That first day or two, you're at altitude and um, avoid caffeine because that also can be dehydrating. Now there is a medicine that you can take if you're gonna be at a high altitude, especially if you don't have that day or two to allow yourself to acclimate at the altitude or if you have a history of having a problem with altitude before, there's a medicine you can ask your physician to write for you that will decrease the risk that you will get ill from being at altitude. But that's something you need to talk to them about, see if you're a candidate for that based on your personal medical history and any medications you're taking. The next thing you want to think about is temperature, either really hot or really cold, again, depending on where you're going. If you're going on a ski trip or if you're going to be hiking out in the mountains in Alaska in January, you always want to think about cold exposure. You want to think about protecting yourself against frostbite. If you are going on a safari in Africa or if you're going to be in the Caribbean or if you're going to be in the jungles in Southeast Asia, obviously there you want to think more about heat exhaustion, heat stroke. In either extreme, you always want to dress for the weather appropriately. You want to stay hydrated because either side you want to, well, you want to be hydrated as well. And then um, if you are in that exposure, you want to get out of that exposure if you start feeling symptoms. So for example, if you're in a really cold environment and you start feeling like the, your fingertips are going numb or your nose is going numb or your ears are going numb, you want that's the sign that you potentially are at risk for a frostbite and you want to get into a warmer environment. And it, in the heat, if you are starting to feel lightheaded and dizzy, or if you had been sweating and you're not sweating anymore, that's when you're at, that's when you're starting to develop heat exhaustion. That's when you know it's time to get into a cooler environment. So in either case, either extreme, planning is key because you want to plan your wardrobe appropriately. You want to have enough water and you want to have a, an out, an exit plan. So in case something happens that you can get into a safer environment. The next thing people always don't think about is air pollution. And this is primarily for people who are traveling to larger cities, especially in um, some parts of Asia, some parts of Africa where they don't have an EPA. And so the, the air quality is not as good. So you, especially in warm days you may have a lot of smoke and smog in the air. Some countries still use coal-fired power plants so there's a lot of pollutants in the air and that is key for people who have any type of respiratory illness or anyone who is pregnant or any small children because those groups are much more um, prone to developing issues from respiratory exposure. So if you are someone like that you all you want to think about your itinerary and think about, okay, am I going to be at risk in this area? And if so, how can I avoid this risk or how can I decrease this risk? If you're on any medications, be sure you take plenty of your medication with you so that you have those inhalers that you need if you need them or any allergy medicine that you take, that you have that with you when you go so that if you do run into that situation, you are um, prepared and you have the medicine that you need to be um, be safe. The last, the, another thing we want to talk about is marine hazards, which means being in the water. But that can be anything from you want to make sure that you know how to swim and that you don't overestimate your swimming abilities, that you don't get into a riptide and then wind up um, 
being at risk for drowning, but also depending on where you're going, if you're going scuba diving, make sure that you are trained, that you know how to scuba dive, that you know your equipment, your equipment is working properly, that you scuba dive with a buddy, that you don't scuba dive on your own. And depending on where you're going, being in the water can put you at risk for jellyfish stings or exposure to um, shark bites, which has been in the news recently, or um, stings from other animals or bites from um, other fish or any, any, any exposures because in the water you're not in your natural environment so you always want to plan ahead, plan accordingly, think about the things that could be there. It's not just, hey let's just have fun, go out in the water. You always want to think about the risk that you are going to be at when you're in these environments that you're not familiar with because scuba diving or being in the water in the Caribbean is a lot different than being in the water here on, on the East Coast and being in the water in the Pacific is a lot different than being in the, in the water in the Atlantic. So you always want to think about the risk for where you are. And if you're going to be doing any scuba diving or anything like that, always have a local guide or someone that knows the area, knows where the risks are, and always, always, always pay attention to the warnings, any warning flags, any warning signs, because that's your best bet to stay safe when you're out in the water. Some of the groups of people who are at higher risk when they're traveling are people who have any kind of medical problems, any people who have any type of problem with their immune system because that puts you at risk for developing infections when you're overseas. Anybody who has any type of chronic illness because there's always a risk that that chronic illness can get worse when you're overseas, when you're not in your natural environment. Perhaps you're <clears throat> being more active than you typically are. Perhaps you're eating different foods. Also, other people who are at risk, people, the extremes of age, either young children or the elderly, because again, their systems are not as, they don't rebound as well. So if they're exposed to something that's infectious, they're much more likely to get really sick than someone who's in the middle of their life. Pregnant women also are at risk. Pregnant women, because you're, 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 you're two people, essentially. So you are definitely at higher risk for infections. You are at risk for blood clots on airplanes, you're at risk for dehydration, and depending on where you are in your pregnancy, you're also at risk for going into premature labor. So if you are a high-risk pregnancy that your physician has told you, or if you are if you're very early in your pregnancy or, or very late in your pregnancy, you definitely want to talk to your physician before you travel to find out what your risks are. And anybody that is um, anywhere in the pregnancy is always a good idea, even if you feel like you're not at high risk, because you want to talk to your physician about can you get the vaccines that you should get based on where you're going and when you're going. Can you take medicine for prevention of malaria? Can you take an antibiotic if you get an infection while you're overseas? So those are the kind of things you definitely want to talk to your obstetrician about before you go, before you even start planning a trip. It's always a good idea to plan ahead because the physician may say, you're going to an area where there's malaria, you are at very high risk because you're pregnant. You might want to put this trip off until after you deliver the baby. So it's always best to, if you even start thinking about international travel when you're pregnant, before you start making any arrangements at all, talk to your obstetrician because that's your best guide for how you and your baby can be the safest for the trip. And um, anytime you have any type of medical illness or any type of medical issue, you want to consider getting a letter from your physician detailing any medicine you're taking, any medical issues you have, if you need to have any type of accommodations of any kind, have a letter from your physician explaining all that. Anyone who is on any type of medication, you want to be sure you take enough of your medication with you when you go so that you don't run out and you want to take your medication in this individual original packaging. You don't want to have the pill box. You don't want to have your pills just all dumped into a Ziploc bag because depending on where you're going, they may need to see the original label with the doctor's name and the name of the medicine to know that it's an actual medication, not an illegal drug of some kind that you're bringing into their country. And depending on where you're going, you also may want to think about carrying some other things along with you to be, um, to be safer when you're traveling. You want to think about getting a first aid kit because that way, if you are injured in any way, you may have bandages or um, all the things you can do to take care of yourself. So if you are in an area where you are not 
able to go down to the local emergency room because there isn't a local emergency room. You have a way to do the basics to take care of yourself, to stop bleeding, to use some antibiotic ointment or something like that so that you have something to get started on. You might want to think about taking some medicine for a fever or pain along with you as well. That way if you develop that, you have that as well because there may not be a pharmacy or you may not speak the language and be able to talk to the pharmacist to ask about this medicine that you need. Think about getting a thermometer so that way you can tell if you're getting a fever or not. Think about taking a medicine for, for diarrhea along with you, one of the over-the-counter medicines because if you get a little bit of diarrhea, a lot of times the over-the-counter medicine will work. If you talk to your physician before you travel, ask them if you should take an antibiotic along with you, and that way you have that with you. So if you need it, you can do that as well. If you are going to an area of the world that has malaria, you want to take an anti-malarial medicine with you as well, and that's something you'd want to talk to your physician before you travel as well. So. Depending, again, it depends on where you're going, how much of the stuff you need. Obviously, if you're going to London, your, your medical kit will look a whole lot different than if you're going to be doing a medical mission in the jungles of Cambodia for a year, where you won't see, um, you may not see any medical providers the entire time you're there. So think about your itinerary, think about where, why you're traveling, think about where you're going to be, think about your risk, think about what facilities will be around you and that will help guide you as far as what you need to take with you. Because you don't want to be thinking of every possibility and overpacking. Because again, if you're going to be in, in London, you don't need to carry all this stuff because you can just go down to the local pharmacy and ask them and they will be able to help you. Or you can go to an emergency room. Well, I hope this hasn't deterred you from international travel because international travel is still very fun. The things that people always think about are the illnesses, the infections, things like that. But as you can see, the number one cause of illness from international travel are the same ones that are in this country. Heart disease is way more than any type of infection, any type of medical illness. So the important thing is you want to plan ahead, you want to mitigate your risk, you want to decrease your risk as much as possible, but at the end of the day, have a good time, get out there and see the world. This has been Health Chat, I'm Dr. Lancey Wynn. Until next time, have a good day.